Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the aquarium. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the aquarium. We're here to release the report of the oil decommissioning platform that was held in uh, January, and Claire just took away all the copies, so uh, <laughs> she, ha she has them. Um, we're competing today against the uh, coronavirus and yesterday's primaries, but I'm delighted that we have th those of you here who are here. Earlier this morning, I had an interview with KPCC. We want to give you a sense of the, the report, and that will be done by a number of the experts who spoke during that forum. And then we have others here who, they didn't speak, uh, but they were in the audience. All of the presentations are on our website, so you can watch everything that happened. This report was intended to be a, an overview, a summary of the major takeaways, so that more people would read it. And the um, you know, flexibility in an uncertain world is always a good strategy. And that's what we want to talk about uh, this morning. So we'll ha have plenty of time for questions and answers. We're going to start by a presentation by John Smith. John is a consultant. He is retired from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and he was very helpful in putting this entire forum to together. So, if, John, if you'll give us an overview of uh, where these platforms are, how many there are, et cetera, that'll get us off to a good start. And let's save our questions until everyone has spoken. Well, thank you, Jerry. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again and share information with the public other interested organizations. Um, as Jerry said, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the OCS platforms that are located offshore California and the regulations, decommissioning regulations, that are applicable to, to those platforms. Uh, this slide shows, it's kind of the vital statistics, it shows uh, the 23 OCS platforms uh, that range in age from 28 to 50 years. Uh, typical design life for these platforms is 30 years, so you can see just from the age of the platforms that many of these uh, are, have reached the decommissioning stage or at least are nearing the decommissioning stage. And the facilities on the OCS uh, range from, in water depth from 95 feet, very shallow, to very deep, almost 1,200 feet of water depth. Now, that is the equivalent to the uh, size of the Empire State Building. Now, these are fixed steel jacket structures to the sea, the, on the seabed. So the immense size of some of these facilities is very impressive. It, California has you know, a fairly significant percentage of the deep water platforms due to the drop off in water depths off our coast. The weight of these facilities ranges from a uh, fairly small, 1,400 tons, that would be platform Gina, and 95 feet of water, and the ultra-large, uh, 86,513 tons for Harmony. So that's a massive amount of material and steel that would need to be removed if these are, are, are fully, fully removed. The operating status, uh, there's 12 producing at the current time, 11 are shut in and five are in the early stages of decommissioning. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, map. It shows all the uh, oil and gas installations offshore California. There are 32 installations. There are 23 OCS platforms. There are four state water platforms and five oil and gas production islands in state waters. So. Uh, if we uh, move, I'll cover these from a kind of north to south. In this case, you can see the, 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 the platform that has uh, at the end, uh, northern end is uh, uh, offshore Santa Maria. That's platform Irene. Let's see. If we come down the coast, this is Harvest Hermosa Hidalgo. Once again, these are all off Santa Barbara County. You come into the Western Channel. You've got uh, three platforms, Hondo, Heritage, and Harmony. Now, the most of the OCS platforms are concentrated 
uh, offshore Santa Barbara County and Ventura County in the eastern S Santa Barbara Channel. There are 12 there. And then there are four OCS platforms uh, in the Beta Unit offshore Long Beach. Now, the OCS is that area that extends from three miles offshore to 200 miles. That's the federal OCS. Uh, this, this is a table I presented in my talk at the forum, and it, it gives uh, the details on the 23 OCS platforms. It shows their uh, installation age, uh, date and, and age, operating, current operating status, water depth, total weight, wells, and the OCS operator. Kind of moving again, this time we'll go from south to north. In the, in the beta unit, uh, which is offshore Long Beach, we have four platforms. So those are all operating, and there are no plans to decommission those at this time. If we move into the eastern Santa Barbara Channel, this is where most of the platforms are located, 12. And you can see that uh, as far as uh, the first two, Hogan and Houchin, they were just shut in in October. Uh, going down the line there, we also have uh, Habitat. That was shut in in 2017. That's a gas platform in the market for gas. It's very poor, so uh, that was one of the reasons that platform was shut in. And then we have uh, also Gale and Grace. Now, those platforms are also shut in in 2017 as a result of uh, Venico, the previous operator, went bankrupt and it relinquished the leases. So Chevron is, uh, is in, in charge of the decommissioning of those. They're currently being operated by Beta West Energy Group. Going into uh, the Western Santa Barbara Channel, we have uh, Har Harmony, Har uh, well, let's see, uh, Heritage, Hondo, and Harmony, and those are operated by Exxon. Now, those have been shut down since the Plains All-American Pipeline spill that occurred on shore in 2015. Uh, there's a lot of reserves there. These platforms will eventually come, likely come back online, but be, that's going to require new pipelines to be built. It's really difficult. It'll be years off probably before they operate again, unless they could get some approval to uh, tanker the oil to refine or by truck. So uh, that's the status of those platforms. And then we go uh, into uh, Santa Maria Basin, Harvest Hermosa Hidalgo. Those platforms are uh, uh, currently shut in, and Chevron and Freeport McMoran are planning the decommissioning of those facilities. So that's kind of an overview of what the action is offshore. If we look at uh, kind of a summary of what we can expect uh, for OCS decommissioning activity, I think we can anticipate that five to ten platforms will be removed this decade. Here we see in red the, the projects that are uh, platforms that are involved in projects that are ongoing. There's obviously some also near, uh, blue near-term can candidates for uh, decommissioning haven't been any decommissioning plans announced for those platforms, but they're shut in, and it doesn't look like they're going to come back online. So uh, that's Hogan and Houchin and Habitat. And once decommissioning starts and the infrastructure, like heavy lift vessels, are brought into the area, there's definitely a potential for several more platforms to be decommissioned, kind of piggyback on, on that uh, availability of the equipment. So, uh, what are the decommissioning regulations on the OCS? What, what do they uh, cover? Uh, uh, platforms must be removed within one year of the termination of a lease. Uh, decommission, it's under 30 CFR 250 uh, subpart Q. That's where the regulations are. Uh, there are some exceptions. The Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement uh, may grant a departure from the requirement to remove a platform uh, under certain conditions. The platform has to become part of the state artificial reef program, and the state acquires a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers and accepts 
title and liability for the structure. Uh, they also have to get uh, U.S. Coast Guard navigation uh, approval, which means that there could be a certain 85 depth, uh, 80 foot, 85 foot water depth requirement for the removal of the uh, upper portion of the jacket. That's typical. Uh, the OCS regulations, 30 CFR 585 subpart J, also uh, allow for platforms to be repurposed for alternative uses, such as marine research centers or renewable energy production facilities. So that's an option. So summary of the key points. Uh, decommissioning is fast approaching, uh, 20 to 25 to 20, 26 it may, may begin in terms of physical removal offshore. Uh, Upcoming projects will, we're going to be world class in scale. Our, our platforms offshore California are some of the deepest fixed structures in the ocean. And this is going to be a, a huge engineering challenge. Uh, full removal, particularly full removal, uh, it's going to present huge engineering challenges, environmental challenges, and material disposal challenges. Where are you going to take this material? Uh, federal OCS regulations include provisions for reefing platforms and allowing alternate uses of platforms. But reefing is, doesn't appear to be a viable option at this time, as we learned at the forum, due to the lack of an approved California artificial reef program and plan. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll bring it to a close and Sorry. turn it back to Jerry. So what's at stake is if uh, California were not to amend AB 2503, the only option we would have for these platforms in federal waters would be full removal. So what would be, we be losing? Well, let's look at what some of the biology uh, on and around these reefs. An Anvil is going to start. Uh, and she is a researcher with the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And Good morning, everyone. I think it'll stay. Um, Hi, I'm uh, Ann Scarborough Bull. Uh, I am a researcher at the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, I have been studying life under platforms uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and off the Pacific for about uh, 30 years, uh, a long time. These structures are, uh, in my mind, uh, novel ecosystems and worth uh, taking a look at uh, what kind of life is there and how that um, is sustainable over time. Uh, from 1995 to, um, I can't really see this very well, to 2013, we surveyed um, 23, the 23 federal platforms offshore and 70 natural reefs. We used uh, a variety of tools to do this. We used two different submersibles and uh, remotely operated vehicles, as well as having scuba divers do the shallow portions of each one of those platforms. We were able to uh, count, identify size, uh, and size uh, over a million and a half fish during, during this uh, effort. 90% uh, of the fishes on the platforms are uh, in the genus of Sebastes, which means that they're rockfish. Now, uh, rockfish are interesting. They are the dominant family and genus of fishes that are on reefs uh, from Alaska to Baja California. So to see reef fish uh, as rockfish all over these platforms would, uh, would be something that uh, would be a surprise in the beginning. And then when you think about the underwater structure 
and the open complexity of the platforms, you realize that, that this would be and has turned out to be uh, the relationship that should occur between a reef fish and a structure acting as a reef. Uh, we have been able to publish over 100 peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers in journals as diverse as the um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science and the Bulletin of Marine Science and the Journal of Coastal uh, and Ocean Management. Uh, we've also been able to provide the US federal government about a dozen uh, thorough reports on uh, Pacific platforms alone. So, uh, so what have we found? We have found that the platforms are encrusted by highly diverse invertebrates, and that um, you know over time. And what do I mean by that? I mean in the last 30 years, it turns out that invertebrates have been harvested from platforms for human consumption, as well as use in bait fisheries such as crab traps and that fisheries. There used to be a company that for almost 20 years actually harvested the mussels that grow in tremendous profusion on the shallow parts of the platforms, harvest them uh, and clean them and sell them. I personally know that at least as far east as Denver, these mussels from the platforms off California were being, being sold as a delicacy. Um, of course, there are non-native species, um, as, as there are the same non-native species in harbors and on nearby natural reefs offshore. So how could these platforms be useful to citizens of California in the future? Well, right now, they are rarely fished. And actually, the platforms up in the Santa Barbara Channel and north of Point Conception are not fished at, at all. The, uh, some of the platforms off of Long Beach are fished occasionally by party boats that will come back in. And before they come into harbor, they'll stop and fish uh, at some distance, but they will fish between uh, platforms off of Long Beach. Um, young rockfish, we tested young rockfish. Uh, they're called young of the year, young of the year. So they are not a year old. They're maybe four months old. We've tested their growth rate and found that they grow as well or better than the same species uh, when we compared them from uh, kelp beds. We also were curious and needed to know what the potential contamination rates of these fish were that were living at the platforms, not just the young ones, but the old, uh, much older, mature rockfish. So we examined um, the contamination load of heavy metals and PCBs and a lot of other components and found that they were uh, no more contaminated than the shoreline uh, same species fished off California. So we did not find in their muscle, in the fillet tissue, in the muscle that you would consume or I would consume, uh, we did not find an increased level of contamination in any of the uh, factors that we examined. I guess that's it. Next, we're going to hear from Jeremy Clace. Jeremy is an associate professor at Cal, Cal State Poly Pomona, and uh, he's also been studying these platforms. Good morning. So I've been working on um, the fish living on these platforms for almost a decade now, um, mostly taking the, the giant data set that Ann and Milton Love and others from UC Santa Barbara um, have collected and analyzing that data and using that to build models of fish production and, and other things that I'll, I'll talk about today. 
Um, so one thing to realize, uh, think about about these platforms is they're really kind of unique structures. They go in terms of compared to natural habitats because they go from the seafloor all the way up to the surface of the water. Um, and because you have that vast vertical structure of hard structure habitat that fish can live on, um, fish that are associated with reef habitats, um, you get a lot of different types um, of habitats basically throughout the water column depending on how far down you are. Um, so younger, primarily rockfish, will arrive at the platforms um, and live associated with the platform structure up away from the bottom. And there can be tens of thousands to up to maybe over 100,000 young rockfish in a given year at a given platform. Um, and, and they'll stay there for um, periods of time. Some of those fish will stay there and survive for multiple years. Um, and that's what we deem the, the nursery effect or the, um, of these platforms. They can act as nursery grounds. Um, for a lot of uh, rockfish, including some important fishery species such as Boccaccio here. And then generally, as those um, fish get older, a general pat pattern that a lot of species of rockfish you see do is as they get older, they tend to move to deeper waters. Um, so on natural reefs, they'll move from shallower reefs to deeper reefs. On a platform, they can move down the platform structure. Um, so as they move down, um, Depending on the depth of the seafloor for a given platform, different things will happen. So if the platform um, is relatively shallow, some of those rockfish will move down like Boccaccio here over a few years. And then if, if the bottom of the platform is not in their preferred um, adult sort of depth range, they'll move away from the platforms probably going to, to natural reefs in the area. On other platforms that are deeper, where the bottom of that platform is in the preferred depth range for a given species, and every species kind of has a different range where the adults like to live, they might stay there. And for a lot of platforms, um, we find at the base of those platforms is where you find a lot of large, um, uh, really large, relatively old rockfish in really high densities. So one thing, um, that we did is take all this data um, and turn those counts of individual species and sizes into estimates of fish production. And what that means is how much new weight of fish do you get in a given year? Um, and from kind of a uh, human perspective, you might think about the weight of a fish is when you go to buy fish at a fish market, you buy um, a fillet of fish by the pound. Um, so from a kind of a fisheries perspective, it makes sense to think about fish in weight. Um, as an ecologist, what uh, production and biomass production is really useful is it allows us to compare sort of ecosystem function across habitats. So with uh, platforms and natural reefs where you might have some of the same species, but maybe there are some different species, um, or from platforms to um, other very different ecosystems like coral reefs or estuaries, we can calculate the total amount of fish production and use that as kind of a, the same metric and compare the overall ecosystem function across habitats um, and different ecosystems. And what we found is generally, if you kind of take an average across all the platforms and compare that to natural reefs in the region, they're about 27 times more productive than natural rocky reefs. Uh, and then if we compare um, individual oil platforms, to other marine ecosystems like coral reefs, estuaries that are known to be really productive, comparing the ones that have been studied in this way, we find that these platforms are among the most productive marine ecosystems globally. <coughs> Additionally, we can look at, um, as those fish get older and you get those really high densities of large um, female fish uh, living at the base of those platforms, we can calculate how much um, how many eggs and larvae do they produce in a given year? And we can compare that to natural reefs. And we find that for some species on some platforms, um, they're really, really, they have really, really high rates of reproductive output, um, tens to hundreds of times the average on natural reefs. Now, it varies uh, highly across platforms and by species. There's 17 species that we found that had really high reproductive rates on some platforms, probably a handful of platforms, but it, it varies dramatically platform to platform. Um, and because of this, and production varies similarly um, from platform to platform, that we really think it's important as we're considering decommissioning options to consider each platform individually, 
um, look at the types of species that are productive there, um, and, and consider them, um, take that into in consideration, maybe not make a decision, um, sort of a broad decision across all platforms, but consider the potential habitat that they are contributing um, on an individual basis. One of the questions we get a lot, um, because one of the, the primary um, decommissioning opt -in options being considered here in California is partial removal. Um, and that's probably going to consist of removing the top 85 feet of the structure, as you see up there. Um, how would this affect um, these high production rates and the fish living on those, the reproductive output? Um, there's been a few studies that we've conducted so far um, looking at this. Um, one part of it is um, removing the, that shallow part of the structure. Um, one study suggested that it's, it shouldn't have a big impact on rockfish reproduction, or rockfish recruitment, so those young rockfish arriving at the platforms. Most of them are going to um, arrive at depths greater than 85 feet. It would impact the really shallow water species that you might find on you know, near shore kelp forest reefs here. Um, but for the rockfish, which make up 90% of the fish living on these platforms, um, it shouldn't affect that process of the new fish arriving and living associated with the platform structure. And then if you um, remove that structure and we recalculated the rates of fish production and the overall um, weight of fish living on the platform, it seems like um, on average about 90% of the fish biomass of production should remain. Um, so that function, we anticipate, should keep going um, even if you're removing um, the top 85 feet. And th this, this uh, figure here, 85 feet, looks like it's taking away you know, 40 or 50 percent of the structure. Um, this is, would be for a relatively shallow platform. For a lot of the platforms, like the ones approaching 500, 1,000 feet, you're only going to be removing 10 to 20 percent of the overall platform structure. So there's still a lot of structure underneath if you remove that, that shallowish portion. All right, that's what I got for today. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. So you don't lo lose a whole lot if, if you remove only the top uh, 85 feet or so. But unless the act is amended, the only option we have is to remove them entirely. It's very clear that the, over the, the decades that these platforms have become magnets and magnifiers of, for fish productivity and also for other forms of marine life. Sylvia Earle gave a keynote address at this forum. And she had been, for many years, thought the best thing to do was to remove these platforms. And that was before she began to dive on them and to study them. And she now has changed her mind. She said, made the comment, Right now, every one of these rigs, these platforms, is a reef. A and that every one is the equivalent of a mini marine protected area. So why would you want to remove them? There was a groundswell of support for reefing and repurposing at this forum. I think there was a strong consensus, not unanimity, but a strong consensus that we should retain this option. I want John Smith to come back up here and, and ask John if you would address, before we throw this open, what would it take for California to keep this option on the table? We don't have a whole lot of time based upon what you said. Five to ten years, some of these are going to be ready to be decommissioned, and unless we act, they will have to be removed within one year of uh, decommissioning. So please, would you come up and please address that? That's a tough question. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think, uh, from what I understand in, in, in all my time working uh, on, the on decommissioning issues, which was quite some time with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, I mean, this, I started working on decommissioning before there was AB 2503 enacted, which does allow uh, uh, reefed offshore structures on the OCS, uh, uh, the state can, if it's, it's willing, uh, take, take those uh, and, and uh, incorporate it into its artificial reef plan, which uh, apparently isn't quite developed to the point where uh, it meets that criteria, however. Uh, in terms of the views of the companies, I think the, one of the, the big issues comes back down to liability. And uh, 
there's a view uh, of some companies that the liability provisions in the existing legislation are somewhat onerous. They would like to see liability provisions that are similar to uh, the Gulf of Mexico artificial reef legislation. Uh, uh, and I think that is probably the, the biggest obstacle at this point. There, the other thing about the AB 2503, there were proposals to amend that act uh, a year or two ago. Uh, Senator Herzog was leading that effort. He's very supportive of that effort. And that, that effort was geared towards streamlining the process. It's a very complex process in AB 2503, which has five or six key agencies making a call. And the thought was, well, they could have a much more streamlined approach with one or two agencies probably uh, uh, being able to do that. So a lot of the amendments were geared towards streamlining the act and addressing some of these issues. But uh, I think there probably needs to be some more work done on the liability side of things. And I think one of the, one of the uh, benefits of this forum is it's drawn attention to those needs. So maybe that will be momentum to move those discussions forward. A number of the, the skeptics say the only reason the oil companies are interested in doing this, this is that they save money. But any savings from if there was, were less than full removal, 80% of the savings would go to the state and it would be put into a fund that could support marine research, marine monitoring, fisheries management, et, et cetera. So that, that isn't really the answer. I, I would say that you know, you were, we're at a very important time. We, with all of the changes that are taking place with climate change and we're on the verge of this, this so-called blue economy where we re-examine our relationship with the ocean, we ought to be looking at some of these, what are considered by some as, uh, to be problems, as opportunities and design some experiments and phase them in so that we don't make mistakes, but that we don't lose these opportunities. And during the Q&A, I suggest you might want to ask a question of Don Kent, the president of, of Hub SeaWorld Research Institute, because he had a proposal a number of years ago to use one of these platforms for white abalone projects. Let's bring the house lights up, and let's take questions, and you can direct them to any of the speakers. And um, if you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Hi, good morning. Uh, this question is for Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy, it's Sandy. Hi. I was wondering, um, this extreme producti productivity on the oil platforms, um, do you think it's, when you compare it to coastal environments, do you think it's because of this self-contained biological structure here versus just our coastal uh, environments are just being overfished or, you know, those impacts or what, what are your thoughts on that? Most of the uh, production for rockfish is on kind of the adolescent <coughs> age, the fish from two to, I don't know, maybe five or six years old. Those are the ones growing the fastest, gaining the most weight, and are most abundant. Um, and I think it's, that's just possible because you have these um, structures with a lot of water flow going through in open environments that are really productive. Our coastline is really productive. We have a lot of upwelling. Um, that's feeding the invertebrates living on these. That's directly feeding some of the fish. Um, the fish are eating the other fish. And there's just, um, across this structure, you have areas for the younger fish where they're living. And then as they move down the platforms, you have um, different kind of sub-habitats for different life stages or different age groups of the fish. And that, you don't see that on natural reefs as much. Um, having sort of the segregation of the different life stages living in different areas. Um, so I think all of that combined just creates this unique situation where you get all this productivity. Uh, it, it, let, let's keep uh, initially questions to those from the media, and then after we've exhausted those, then we'll go to anyone else. Anyone? Yes. Uh, Martin, Martin Wiskell with the Orange County Register and the Press-Telegram. Um, 
I'm really uh, interested in understanding a little bit better what needs to happen legislatively um, uh, for to, to maintain these as reefs once they're decommissioned. Um, so I, I have a, a, a few questions. I'll, I'll throw a, a couple out for starters. Was, was the streamlining amendments by Senator Herzog, were they successful? And was that streamlining intended to make it easier to establish an artificial reef program? And are there any advocates in Sacramento now prepared to move this forward? Would this have to be a legislative uh, uh, action or could it be administrative? Uh, it would have to be a legislative action. Uh, the amendments uh, could address things like the permitting process within the legislation and then and the key agencies involved. Uh, one of the proposed amendments was that uh, air emissions should be considered in AB 2503, the 2010 Act, in terms of determining net environmental benefit. Uh, air emissions weren't incorporated into that kind of equation, but the amendments that are proposed by Herzog would, would do that. So it's a combination of addressing issues like that. Under the AB 2503, one of the tests or criteria for a reefing structure was that it had to be a net environmental benefit, uh, but that was primarily considering habitat value and biology and things like that, and, and not air emissions. And with regard to these huge structures, uh, deep water structures, if you bring in heavy lift vessels, dismantle those, you're going to have very significant air emissions. So that it was a recognition that maybe that was an oversight of AB 2503 and that should be addressed and, and the streamlining would uh, uh, just make it a much more easier process in terms of uh, having agencies that, they had d a different agencies that responsible for different parts like CEQA was one agency, but the permitting approval was another agency. And then you had net environmental benefit analysis, which is under the Ocean Protection Council. So Senator Herzog was looking at that, and he had proposals for making that much more efficient. Well, it was a two-year bill, and it went through several committee uh, uh, revisions, and uh, it didn't get uh, it has to be passed within two years, and if it doesn't, you have to resubmit uh, it. No, it's not. That two-year cycle is over, but it, it would have to be reintroduced. But I think on the basis of forums like this, where a lot of new information has been shared, that would be, it might be timely. Uh, was there opposition? Uh, there's always opposition <laughs> to reefing, but uh, I don't know that that, that drove the process uh, to the point where it didn't get enacted. I think there were a lot of other things going on, higher priorities within the legislature, et cetera. So I don't know exactly the reason they, they, they didn't get, I thought it may have been that people wanted to see some more analysis and research, which is what this forum uh, has presented. So uh, I think it would be interesting to see if uh, Senator Herzog or someone else in the Senate Assembly wants to pick pick up the ball and run with it in terms of uh, addressing the issues that we've heard here. Nothing in motion at this time? No, not that I know of, no. Senator Herzog ha has a copy of this, this report. If the bill would have to be amended in order to benefit for the, this kind of a program where uh, if the owner operator of a platform can transfer it to the state, the state has to have an approved and funded artificial reef program, and we do not. If you look at the five states around the Gulf of, of, Gulf of Mexico, all five have approved artificial reef programs, and they have uh, decommissioned about 500 platforms. We've got 24 that we're, we're worrying about. Uh, the, the reefs, if they've, they've and, and um, I have to believe we have as, as much competency in California, but maybe. So, so you sent um, uh, Senator Herzog a copy of the report. Yes, if we will, we will. <laughs> <laughs> we we will be. 
We will be, no, we can only educate, we can't lobby. But this is a matter of education. A and um, so we will be delivering copies of these to all of the members of the, the both the Senate and, and the, the Assembly. Who, who, uh, other from the, go ahead. Just two questions, sorry, I'm Anita Harris from the Signal Tribune. Um, for our local readers, um, uh, one question is, what about the oil rigs off of Long Beach? Um, can you give me an update on that? And then also, I'm curious about the liability question. Why is, what is the liability exactly that they're worried about? For I'm gonna turn to, <laughs> did you mean the, uh, the platforms off Long Beach or the four oil islands? Um, both. <laughs> <laughs> so you get them both. Yeah. Well, th that's the beta unit, uh, as you saw on my map. That's offshore Long Beach. There are four OCS platforms. Uh, those are currently operating, and the uh, operator hasn't indicated that there's any plans at this point to consider decommissioning those. So uh, we're not, they're not in play as far as decommissioning at this time. Now, you also have the, the Thumbs Islands. Uh, they're offshore Long Beach. These are... Uh, artificial islands that were constructed to, you know, support oil and gas drilling and production. Uh, it's all on state waters. There are no plans to decommission any of those facilities at this time. The two state water projects that are, are moving forward are uh, Platform Holly, which is offshore Goleta, Santa Barbara County, that's in state waters, and uh, Rincon Island, which is an artificial island. Uh, it's offshore uh, Ventura, County uh, and uh, maybe Southern Sa Santa Barbara County, but that project is on uh, moving forward. They're decommissioning wells, and they're going to have to develop a plan for either removing that island or repurposing it or, or something, as well as Polly. I mean, the, the decision there is uh, state lands will have to make a decision whether they were cons consider reefing uh, that structure or not, or maybe repurposing it for marine science center or something like So those are all options. The state is not taking a position on any of that. Every, all options are open at this time. They'd have to go through a NEPA CEQA, uh, CEQA process, uh, evaluate all the alternatives, and, and go from there. So that's what and, I'm and with the, what is the opposition? <laughs> I think the only opposition I heard in the forum was that uh, the contaminants that might be left behind if, if these platforms were removed. What would I think there's two points. Uh, Linda Kraft from the EDC was, you know, spoke at the, the forum, and she mentioned that, you know, it was, in her mind, it, when the platforms were installed, they were kind of promised to be removed at the end of life. So that's, that's kind of one, one point. The other point was she was concerned about, as Jerry said, uh, shell mounds and things like this, which could con have hydrocarbon contaminants and could, if you left them there long term, maybe they could be uptake in the marine environment and the fish, and, and which could be neg you know, negative. So uh, science hasn't shown that that's been conducted to date. So uh, Anne made a good point on that. Uh, there, but uh, that was kind of the, I heard two main points, I think. There are people who oppose anything new, anything different, and um, that happens all the time. Who else from the press has a question? And I then there we'll, was a we'll second go part to our question, which oh. was liability, right? Oh, liability, oh. yes. Yes, that's, uh, that's an, Interesting issue. I mean, if we look at the Gulf of Mexico, each of the states has um, an artificial reef act that's been enacted. There's also, you know, uh, National Fisheries Enhancement Act. It's a federal law uh, that basically uh, allows platforms to move forward in, in being reefed. Under that law, uh, they can, uh, let's see, uh, you can reef platforms. Uh, well, there, there's a there were guidelines under the law. There were reefing guidelines, national reefing guidelines, uh, published, uh, and those guidelines say as long as you meet certain criteria. Under that act, it says as long as you meet all the criteria in those guidelines, 
that your liability is limited. Do companies really like that approach? That doesn't exist here. Under the AB 2503, the issue is basically one where uh, it's the companies are totally liable, liable and even to the point where uh, if the state agencies kind of uh, misstep, they're still liable. So I think the industry views that as <coughs> too much. They wouldn't really like to see more reasonable, in their opinion, liability provisions. And if the Gulf of Mexico liability provisions under the National Fisheries Enhancement Act and the National Artificial Reef Guidelines could be followed, they would be probably a thumbs up. But they don't see that in California. So that's, that's one of the big issues. Yeah. yeah. So what's the cost range for an oil company to entirely remove? And obviously, it depends upon size and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a decommissioning cost report. It's posted on the uh, Bureau of Safety and Environmental, uh, on the wet federal website. And it's uh, a cost report that looks at the cost of fully removing all 23 OCS platforms. And the c total cost for all 23 platforms is estimated to be about $1.5 billion. So uh, just a kind of a general rule of thumb, in the past I've seen some estimates that if reefs, if you could reef the platforms, you would save half, at least half that amount of money. Uh, and then 80% of that would go to the state? 80% of the cost savings would go to the state. That's by, by the uh, AB 2503, the state uh, brings to reef uh, marine, what's it? California Legacy Act, I think, I think it is, Marine Legacy Act. They, 80% uh, has to go to uh, the state. And that would in turn go into an endowment fund, which would provide money to uh, enhance the marine environment, address other issues and support uh, and that. 80% Yes. I think you want to say, I want, why do, let me ask, why do you think there's opposition? You've, you and Sylvia, Sylvia said there's opposition because people are unaware of how valuable these, these platforms are. What, what's your response? Well, uh, before, before I address that, I want to address liability. Okay. Okay. That, uh, there's liability for the oil or gas wells. That liability never goes away. That liability is owned and uh, held by uh, the oil and gas company who, uh, who are actually plugging, plugging those wells. So that never goes away. So this liability question it, that, uh, it, was mentioned this morning is about the reef and who who where is the liability for the jacket structure and it, it could be fishing it could be diving it could be aquaculture it could be a lot of different things and so who's going to carry that liability and how is it going to be uh, looked at and enforced uh, it it is pretty onerous idea that if the state made a mistake uh, somehow, somewhere, th that a company would continue to, and they would hold the liability anyway. That's, that seems uh, to be the stumbling point. So then uh, opposition. I think there's been opposition for this uh, entire idea of getting oil out of the ground and certainly out of offshore since 1969, and it's very firmly um, held. I think it's an advocacy position, and I think that's fine. Um, but I don't think it considers potential production or potential life. Um, and California, the state of California is really has said that it's important to keep our marine environment 
uh, to the best that we can and to have a lot of fisheries related uh, protections done, like you see marine protected areas uh, being uh, created and held and studied. And, and I think that, uh, that the concept needs to be enlarged to consider the platforms um, as well uh, because of what Jeremy has found um, looking at all the data. And uh, John, I was going to ask you a question. That with in, in terms of the liability that doesn't stay with the oil company, couldn't some of these savings uh, go to offsetting some of this liability? Uh, yes, it, it definitely could do that. Uh, the, one of the points I wanted to make on environmental opposition, I'll just try to cover real briefly what Linda Croft from the Environmental Defense Center said at the forum. Uh, this is a really important point. She said in the past, you know, you know basically that her, her environmental coalition, and she's not representative of the environmental uh, groups at large, but she is uh, very prominent in Santa Barbara County uh, with Get Out Oil Out and other things. But she said in the, that they were really opposed to reefing because they thought it would provide an incentive for the companies to stay and or actually make money and continue to produce oil and gas and, and rather than decommission. And I think the dynamics of that have changed because if you've been following events in the last couple of years, California has passed enacted laws that basically say you can't process any oil on shore from offshore, you can't transport it to shore in a pipeline. So in my mind, there's no new lease, no, ver, no possibility, I don't think, of any, uh, leasing in the future, really. Uh, uh, it's very low likelihood of any new leasing being successful because California would stop that. And the oil and gas can't go to shore anymore. There's, there's no incentive. You can't, you can't produce it and make a profit. So I think that issue has sort of gone away, and I'm hoping maybe that uh, can relieve some of those concerns that the environmental groups had in the past. Jeremy, did you want to add anything to what Ann had, had said? Um, not really. No? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions from the media? Yes, go ahead. Oh, it was actually answered. So. <laughs> Part was answered? It was answered, yeah. Okay. Any other from the media? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Lindsay Glasgow from the Log Newspaper. Um, this is a question for Jeremy and Ann. Um, I was curious um, if, um, going off the topic of every oil rig being addressed individually, is there research that has been done um, to show whether or not the, the rigs that are closer to shore and shallower waters are also um, successful artificial reefs or have as much production as some of the further out ones that are deeper? Jeremy? Yeah. Um. We've looked at, we've calculated production for each of the platforms, um, and there's wide variability across. And it's not as simple as the bigger, taller platforms are more productive than the smaller ones. There's big ones that are very productive, and then there's big ones that are less productive, and there's smaller ones that are more productive and less productive. Um, to some degree, we understand that for individual species, that pattern of moving down the platform and where the base of the platform is located plays a large role. But the variability across platforms in terms of what species are there um, is very high. There's different species that are the most dominant on different platforms, and that changes over time. It's just kind of something that's understood in fisheries um, and, and uh, fish biology that Things vary with ocean conditions year to year, and you'll get a big, a really good year for a certain species, and they'll live there, and then these species are very long-lived. They can live for decades, so you'll see that pulse of fish sustain. So on these platforms, um, particularly the ones that have been studied for five or ten years, you'll see a period where they get really good um, recruitment of young fish coming in, and then that platform is really productive for the next five or six years. Um, and if they get another pulse, then that'll stay productive. But some kind of go up and down. Um, we can't, we're, one thing we're kind of working on is trying to understand what are the specific factors that might affect that. Um, and that's a large kind of marine biology question in general in terms of what really controls 
um, recruitment and fisheries from year to year, and, and now with our environment changing so rapidly on these warm years and cold years, um, it just makes the whole story a little more complicated. Okay, now we'll, we'll uh, let's see. Don, Don, come on down here. I want to ask you a question, and we'll throw it open to anybody. I, a number of years ago, you had a proposal for one of the platforms to uh, grow white abalone, and uh, say a little bit about that. And might, might that be something we would do in the future? Well, we have several endangered species of abalone in California, the white abalone and the black abalone, and there's already a recovery. Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Don Ken. I'm with Hub SeaWorld Research Institute in San Diego. Uh, my primary interest in research is in aquaculture for replenishment and for food production. So, uh, so we have these endangered species. There are recovery plans, for at least for the white abalone, that calls for production of uh, many thousands of uh, four-inch long abalone that can be translocated back out into the wild. The population has been so depleted that uh, the abalone aren't able to effectively recover on their own. Uh, abalone have to be within, uh, males and females have to be within a very uh, limited distance, maybe less than 10 meters of one another for them to broadcast breed effectively. And the population has been so heavily decimated that that, that density is, is way too low now. Uh, so even with marine protected areas uh, that, that should represent free areas where these animals can reproduce or, and, or repopulate from, from larvae settling, uh, there just isn't enough brood stock out there uh, founding population to support the overall uh, recovery. So uh, a game plan was developed by the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Marine Fisheries Service that's responsible for endangered marine species to uh, produce hundreds of thousands of juvenile abalone. And this is a program that the aquarium's involved in, as is, I, I believe, the Cabrillo Aquarium. The department, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, which is part of NOAA, the University of California, Davis, Bodega Marine Laboratory, uh, and commercial uh, abalone farmers that, that have the expertise to do this. But one of the things that we, we don't have room for is nursery. Uh, where can we grow these animals to four inches? These, these guys don't grow very fast, so it takes four years to get them to a four inch release size. And the idea we, uh, we formulated was, well, we have these platforms that are over deep, clean water. Uh, we can draw water up from the, from the ocean, uh, even below the thermocline where the water's colder. These abalone like uh, colder water. You find white abalone uh, below the thermocline. Uh, and use these platforms as nurseries uh, to produce hundreds of thousands. And then uh, divers can take them out and translocate them in habitats suitable for the, for the abalone to reproduce. This is what's been done with the California condor. We had to go out and catch wild condors to reproduce them, to, to reintroduce them into the wild. And it's not the most desirable way to do something, to artificially try to repopulate. But in this case, it's the only way we're going we're gonna to see this happen. So um, it's a resource that, that would be available that could be used for that. And in addition to that, it keeps all the other life that's under these platforms going. It doesn't do anything that interferes with the natural processes that are already underway that, that create these. I, th I think uh, Ann mentioned them as de facto marine protected areas. We, we've taken chunks of our coastline and set them aside for conservation, for uh, supporting wildlife. And then we have 23 examples of that that are already there, as Jeremy said, are producing far more productively than, than any natural reef is. So. It just makes sense to try to keep these in place. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, but I am a conservationist, and I got to dive on one of these platforms once, and it was the most amazing dive I've ever had in my life. So I think that's the big selling point, is to get people out there and get to see this. You, you had a question before, right? Yes. Wait, let, let's get a microphone, because this is being streamed live, and otherwise people. I'm, OK, I'm not nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so be careful. <laughs> Um, my question comes from uh, the area of climate change. So I was wondering, from the scientific point of view, if you, since these studies were over time, if you were able to collect any data that would indicate that the artificial reefs were more or less resilient to temperature change and acidification than the natural reefs. Ann or Jeremy? Well, we've seen changes over the 
20, 25 year period that, that we've looked and we've taken uh, temperature data and then uh, CTD uh, data, which is a, a way to say that we've measured the water temperature and we haven't done a lot of pH work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's being done at UC Santa Barbara in, in shallow waters um, where you have um, seagrasses and things like that, which, which seem to highly affect and, and stabilize the pH. Um, in certain places, and it's pretty shallow water, you know, like a foot deep type of, of thing. So uh, we really haven't been looking at climate change. One of the uh, things that we've been thinking about is that we have all of this information. We have had it over a number of years. Let's go back and see if we can correlate that right. to, to that. Well, we haven't done that yet. Um, another, uh, do you have any more questions about that? No, that was it. I just wondered if there was a, a data that would support whether or not they were more resilient to changes in, in ocean temperature and acidification. There's a possible, um, you know, remediation is the uh, point as, you know, we start warming up. Whether we could, um, another. Well, we have had some warm years. We've had El Nino. Um, uh, La Nina years in all the time that, that we've been looking. It was very interesting to me that in a strong El Nino year, we actually had a significant increase in one species of rockfish mm -hmm. that settled on the platform. But it was also a good year for upwelling, so it's hard to parse some of these um, unique minor items out. Right. It seems to me that it, you know, a natural reef is more of a horizontal community, and you have an artificial reef, which is a vertical community, and that's possibly that would give creatures more access to colder environments if the temperature of the ocean is warming up, which might make it more successful than a horizontal reef over time in a warmer climate. That that was what. Well, I it's thought. absolutely over this relatively small footprint, mm -hmm. which would be the the footprint of the actual platform because it goes all the way up to the water column and it's an open lattice structure. You have a lot of bang for your buck, a tremendous amount of habitat over a small right. footprint. And it seems to be a key characteristic that helps to drive these huge uh, numbers of fishes and very vibrant communities is this uh, phenomenon. Um, in the most recent literature of 2020, you have global studies that are now looking at verticality, mm -hmm. all, if that's a word, <laughs> verticality, um, <laughs> as it is now, yes, it's being verticality as a novel ecosystem. That that's, was my thought because, I mean, another selling point for this whole concept could be you're offering a, a place for these species to migrate in in um, adversarial conditions. Right. Yeah, and it, uh, a derivative of that is the, one of the big effects of climate change will be the rise in sea level and what it's going to do with Southern California's wetlands and, and, and beaches because the predictions are with the rise of sea level three to five feet by 2100, most of our wetlands and sandy beaches will be gone. So we have to be thinking about creating habitat, I think, and this is, this is a way to do it. Uh, anybody else have a, have a question? I thought you were you were answering. Go ahead. Uh, so this kind of relates to the cost question and indirectly with climate change. I don't think you guys touched upon this, but can you talk a little bit about the vessels that are capable of removing these structures? Um, the fact that there's only a handful of them and why it may be more efficient for us to do Maybe a handful as few as two or one or two. John? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a, a big challenge. Uh, we haven't had decommissioning in the past in California except for the 4-H plat Chevron pl uh, platform abandonment program which was back in 1994. So essentially on the west coast there are no heavy lift vessels. Uh, you would have to bring in 
uh, those types of vessels to decommission the platforms. These vessels uh, are unique and they're very expensive and it costs a lot of money to bring them into California. For example, if you take like Harvest Hermosa Hidalgo, those were four to up to 600, almost 700 feet of water in some cases. So those three platforms off Point of Guayo. You, you might have to bring in a vessel like the Saipan 7000, which has the lifting capability to remove those very heavy deep water structures. Uh, one of the issues is, and we learned at the forum, was that uh, what you essentially have to, if you brought that vessel in, it, it has a sec 75 megawatt po of power. You're essentially bringing in a, 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 a power plant you know, that would serve 20,000 people for a whole year. That's an amount of uh, power uh, generation, diesel engines and so on. Now that's gonna be a big issue in terms of air emissions. But you have platforms that vary in water depth from 90 to 1,200 feet of water. Uh, you can use smaller heavy lift barges. You probably need, may, maybe for the smallest platform, you could use a 500 uh, ton capability lift barge, a very kind of a small vessel. But you're going to need a 2,000 or 4,000 ton lift barge for the midwater, you know, two, 300, 400 feet. And you're probably going to need a uh, state of the art vessels for the deeper water structures. And these are tremendously expensive. They can be up to $500,000 per day uh, in cost. They can range anywhere from like two to $300,000 up to $500,000 or more. Now the problem is with there is no infrastructure here, so you have to bring those vessels in. Those vessels just to mob and demob them, which is to come to the area, and what you pay, have to pay for them to come here, and you have to pay for them to go back. So a 100-day mob at $500,000 a day, for example, that's $50 million. That's just your travel time. That's not dismantling anything. So you, you have these tremendous costs, uh, and that's, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the incentives for obviously the, comp the companies to, to reef a platform is you can avoid a lot of those costs. You can bring in smaller, less expensive vessels. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, you, then you avoid all the other very, very significant challenges because if you're going to remove a structure that eight, is 80,000 tons uh, of steel, where are you going to take it? Even to, to take that material to shore in California looks maybe, there's no facility that can take that volume. So uh, that's another huge challenge. So, uh, yeah, and I think the point was also made at the forum that if you're going to incur this huge cost while you have it here, you don't just take out one or two. Let, let's take them all out. And uh, the, but the, the potential losses, I don't mean financial, the, the environmental and the opportunity, the opportunity costs are, are huge. Well, anybody else have, have one? We, we're... This has been a good discussion. I think um, this is a, an issue where some good uh, public education through the media, and we are going to distribute this report. And please join me in thanking our, our speakers this morning. I, I, w I wanted to make one final remark. It didn't get picked up earlier, but uh, we talked about the fact that OCS platforms, the 23 OCS platforms can't, I mean, the view is they can't current currently be reefed because the state doesn't have an approved uh, California artificial reef program or plan. So uh, that's an uh, issue that has to be addressed either two ways, through amendments to the legislation or separately, uh, Cal Fish and uh, Wildlife basically s told the folks at the conference that they haven't been funded to develop the program or plan and they, they to to take a reef, they would have to do that as well as develop regulations. And absent any funding, uh, you know, that's not going to be an option to reef because they, uh, and that's one of the obstacles that can be, that will need to be addressed. Apparently in past years, there were proposals to fund uh, Fish and Wildlife up to $7 million to develop their uh, California, formal California artificial reef plan and uh, regulations for reefing structures, but it didn't get incorporated into the last state budget. So it's, it's a loose end that is going to have to be addressed by 
legislation one way or another. And, and I, again, I think it comes back to the, the, the avoided costs and the benefits to California. In the Gulf of Mexico, those states get 50% of the, the savings. In California, we would get 80%. That's a lot of money, and you can do good things with that money. So with that optimistic note, thank you all for being here.